all three days at least. So, yeah, I'm closer to the mic. Okay, there we go. So, so yeah, my name is Randy, uh, at least for the purposes of this talk. And the uh, I'm doing a talk called Never Go Full Spectrum Cyber. Let that sit. <laughs> this too could happen to you. So who am I? I'm uh, Randy. I live and work in Sunnyvale Trailer Park. I love some cheeseburgers. Ser seriously, got some cheeseburgers. Bring them up here. I'll eat them right now. What's that? Let the liquor do the thinking, right? So yeah, um, Jim Leahy's not here right now, but uh, anyway, if you're wondering what full spectrum cyber is, I, I couldn't tell you, but I will tell you that Northrop Grumman sells it. <laughs> so, comes in a can. Comes in a can? Oh, that's good to know. It's a diet version. That's good to know. And relevant XKCD. If you can read that. Basically it says uh, you have a huge budget and you can't figure out cyber was, you know, retired like a decade ago. So, um, so a little disclaimer, just because I'm going to talk about doing illegal things, is just don't do illegal things. Uh, or do, um, you're adults, if you want to go to jail, that's on you. So, you know. Uh, and if you do, report any and all illegal activity to InfoSec Mr. Leahy, and he'll respond appropriately, probably by drinking. All right, so story time. Uh, I'm going to basically just talk about some people who have gone full spectrum cyber. The first one is a guy named Roy Sun. Uh, Roy was a guy who was a fairly successful guy. He, he graduated in 2010 from Purdue with an electrical engineering degree. Um, he went on to a graduate program at Boston University, and he did very well for himself. He got straight A's this, the whole time, but weirdly enough, his last semester at the school, he never even attended class except maybe one of them. Turns out, he was stealing his, profess his uh, teacher's credentials, and, uh, sorry, let me get back close to the mic and basically changing his grades. And he basically had gotten away with it. I mean, he graduated, he moved on to, uh, to go on the graduate program. He also had a friend of his named uh, Mitsutoshi Shirasaki, and he was also a friend of Roy's son. He was an international exchange student, and he also had five very high grades. Well, look, he got busted. And it turned out he was using key loggers. He was installing key loggers in, professors, in the professor's offices. He was uh, picking the locks to their doors and then installing a, like a replacement keyboard. And that's how he was getting the credentials. Well, it turned out Mitsutoshi had learned this whole thing from Roy. Um, Roy had taught him how to pick locks, how to find similar or identical keyboards to the ones that the professors were using, buy them, install keylogger devices in them, break into their offices when they weren't there, and replace the keyboard with the one that did the key logging. And it all was going great. So both of them were getting straight A's, and they were getting away with it. Until Mitsutoshi got caught. And the way he got caught was he for whatever reason, thought it would be a good idea to, he, I guess he didn't like the password the professor was using, so he decided to reset the professor's password. Not once, but twice. And after the second time, the professor got like a little suspicious and called the help desk, and he was like, why does my password keep getting reset? I'm not the one doing it. So they look in the logs, and they see somebody was doing it from an IP address. And that IP address happened to be the university's student or public Wi-Fi that you have to have a university account to sign into. So obviously they traced it directly back to Mitsutoshi. Hop sec, yeah, well, we get there. So, 
Mr. Satoshi gets pulled into an office, he immediately tells them everything, how he was doing it, tells them about Roy, how Roy taught them, how to do it. Roy got charged, lost, got kicked out of school, lost his uh, degree at uh, Purdue, got kicked out of the graduate program at Boston University. Uh, there was another guy, Sharma, he was actually just standing lookout and while the other guy broke into the other professor's office and he got, uh, one of his grades changed. He also got busted. But the best part is, is Roy got busted, kicked out of school, I forgot the way to with it, and the Mitsutoshi, who because he's an international exchange student, flies back to Japan before he can even face trial. So the guy who screwed it up for everybody, he gets, he, he's basically at home in Japan right now. So yeah, life lesson. So, next guy, Scott, I don't even know how to say his last name. Uh, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, was, I looked at this picture and the first thing I thought was, where's this fedora and, uh, and katana? <laughs> He's got the little ponytail and everything. Yeah, this guy, uh, he was a... <laughs> this guy was an anonymous member, uh, or thought he was. And basically, he thought it would be cool to, uh, as part of Operation Avenge Julian Assange, to uh, hack into an InfraGuard website, chapter website in Florida. If you're not familiar with InfraGuard, they're heavily affiliated with the FBI. <laughs> Just a little bit, yeah. So, not only does he hack into it, then he tweets about it to the FBI press office. It's like, ha, ha, hacked your site. Well, yeah, so they didn't even have to look hard to figure out who had done it. He told them. Of course, he gets busted. So now, this, those, those two last examples are a little bit more, uh, what do you call it, amateur hour. So I wanna talk, even professional criminals can get busted because especially large operations that require a lot of people involved, um, you only need a couple of idiots to screw up everything for everyone else. So I'm going to talk about, if you may have heard about this one, it's called the St. Petersburg heist, or it's referred to as that. Um, basically, it took place in late 2012, early 2013. Over $40 million were stolen from two banks uh, overseas in Omar, Oman, excuse me, uh, but Bank Muscat and Rock Bank. Um, basically, what happened was hackers had gotten to their payment processor, which was based in India, and from there, they were able to steal thousands and thousands of card numbers uh, for prepaid travel cards. From there, what happened was they did what's called an unlimited operation. Uh, if you don't know what an unlimited operation is, is they basically take the accounts once they're in the system and remove the uh, withdrawal limits. So, you know, if you go to your ATM and you put your card in, if you're, especially if you've ever spent like a week in Vegas, and you're like, you're, you're trying to withdraw a certain amount of money from your account, after a certain amount, your bank usually has a limit on how much you can withdraw per day. So, you know, it may be 250, maybe $500. So what they do is they go ahead and take those off so you can withdraw as much as possible, basically empty the accounts. What they do is then they send uh, those, the card numbers uh, to small teams overseas are called cash or mule teams. And what they'll do is they'll go ahead and take those card numbers and clone them onto just Mac Stripe plastic cards, like you see every day, like your credit card. And then they'll go around to various ATMs and basically put the cards in, plug in the PIN numbers, and then pull out as much money as they possibly can. And they'll go from one ATM to the next, pulling out money and just emptying the accounts. And they do it in a very coordinated fashion usually around the same time frame so that the bank has very little time to respond and lock the accounts. So, you, you know, you just have everyone doing it all across the world at once. By the time the bank uh, becomes aware of what happened, the accounts are already emptied. See, like I said, whoever did this was basically very professional. This wasn't their first time doing it. This was just the largest operation they had done th thus far. Um, the organization that did it is believed to be in St. Petersburg, Russia. That's why it's called the St. Petersburg Operation. So, yeah. Anyway, like I said, if you, you're doing a heist like this, 
you got a lot of people involved. Sometimes it's hard to find good help, people who know good tradecraft and know what to do and what not to do. So there's this one guy based out of uh, New York City. He was part of the New York City team named Elvis Rodriguez. Um, he basically went around and he is wearing his Domino's pizza cap. And he worked for Domino's Pizza. So he went to all the ATMs in front of all the ATM cameras. I mean, everyone knows they have cameras. Didn't wear sunglasses, didn't wear anything, just walked up, pulled out the money, has his Domino's Pizza cap on, so then it had his full face, and they had a clue where he worked. From there, uh, they were able to figure out where he was, who he was, because he'd just go, through, to go to Domino's and say, hey, do you have any employees matching this description? Uh, they bust him. They find on his cell phone pictures with him and his other friends that were in part of the heist with piles of cash. And also, he was walking around with like expensive Rolexes, like $40,000 Rolexes, and driving a new car, which is not too bad for someone who delivers pizzas for Domino's. It might stand out a little bit. So basically, once they got to him, they were able to find his computer, found the email addresses back to the, the main organization in Russia. Um, and didn't everybody else on his team went down with him. Uh, not just him, it's also the leader who was uh, also located in the Dominican Republic had fled back. He got killed before he could face trial. Funny enough, he was playing a game of dominoes. And apparently someone had found out he'd come into some money through the heist, and he basically, in a botched robbery attempt, he was shot dead in his house, like a few weeks after this, uh, the incident had occurred. But yeah, his whole team went down. Uh, the only reason we probably can attribute the attack to the organization in St. Petersburg, Russia, is because they you know, were able to catch uh, Elvis. And if the leader hadn't got killed, had gotten killed before then, before they could get him, it may have led back further into the organization. So, yeah. Lizard Squad. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of these guys. They're, they're morons. <laughs> they want to be little sex so bad, and they're not. And just, this is one of their members. Uh, this guy goes by the name of Obnoxious, a.k.a. Internet Jesus OB. I don't know what that is. Uh, because he was a minor in Canada, his records are sealed, so we don't actually know his real name. But his whole thing, or shtick, was he would swat people constantly. He would go and find people that he just didn't like, who had offended on the Internet, dox them, find out who they are, and then consistently have them swatted over and over again. Um, you can actually find news articles about a particularly family who harassed constantly because some girl on the internet didn't like him. And so he decided it was, justice was to just make her life a living hell. Uh, so he constantly had her do uh, swatted. Um, she was swatted. She had to leave her university where she was enrolled. She went back to her parents' house to live, and then the, the SWAT, they were, she was getting swatted at, uh, at her parents' house, and it was just happening constantly, and there was nothing they could do to stop it. Now, how many people here are familiar with what swatting is? Okay, so I don't really need to explain it, but just the quick, quick version is basically it's when you call the police, pretend that uh, you're like a gunman or somebody who's threatening a family, and just tell them you're going to kill somebody if this much money or whatever's not delivered, and then the cops show up in full force, full SWAT gear, break in your house, break down your door, aim guns at you, and you don't even know what's going on. And the problem is the cops have to respond to this. Like, they can't just say, oh, no, this guy's probably doing, this is probably just a prank, because they, they can't make that call. Um, so he was getting away with it for a long time until he decided to live stream it on a gaming website. And this actually has audio, but I'm not going to share it. But yeah, it has him on a gamer, um, sort of gamer streaming website. Just make, you can, you can hear the full recording of him making the call to the police, saying he's going to swat somebody, and uh, just 
the whole thing, going through the whole rigmarole where he's, you know, claiming he's a guy that's going to shoot people if he doesn't get cash, et cetera, et cetera. There was over 100 people watching the stream when this happened. A few of them thought to call the cops and say, look, this guy's doing this. This is a hoax. And from there, they were able to trace it back to who he was, and he got busted. So, yeah. The next guy, Edward Lucian Mandrew, a.k.a. Wolfenstein. Uh, this guy hacked a DOD website in 2006, which you can see up there. He was pretty, actually, he was pretty sophisticated. He, like, hacked them from other compromised boxes sitting in Japan. So that's as far as they were able to get, that, you know, they were, whoever hacked us hacked us from this box, and from there they couldn't go any further. The only clue they had was a Yahoo email address that he'd used uh, somewhere in the attack to identify himself. He'd gotten away with it. They were looking for him for a couple of years. Then he decides to, he needs to find a job. He posts his CV online. He decides, I'm, I have this old email address laying around. For, I'll just put that on my CV. Turned out the same one he used before. I guess he'd forgotten where he'd used it. And this is what happened. Immediately arrested. Um, so yeah. The next guy, this is another sophisticated attacker. Uh, Ching Ching Chen Ping, aka CPYY. Um, he'd used an email address to register domains that were used for command and control servers. And he'd also used this email address to register all his other accounts at other places, and including a Picasso, some Picasso accounts, um, pictures, exactly, with pictures uploaded of him with other military officials. This is how they were able to tr figure out who uh, APT was, or the, you know, one of the uh, military units were, because the, the, they later on they re-registered that domain with different emails. They scrubbed it, but you could just go back through the domain history and find out, hey, these domains are being used in this attack for these command and control servers. It's registered to this. We don't know who it's registered to now, but six years ago it was registered to this email address, and then they just go look online. They found lots of places where this email address has been used. For, uh, where they use the handle CPYY. So even a nation state can screw up. Uh, Hu Ming, you know, I don't know how to say that. Uh, he ran a huge website called superget.info, and basically these sites where it sold people's identities. So he would basically hack into sites, consumer, web, consumer data, get consumer data, and then sell the identities of people to uh, anyone who was purchasing, most of the people who bought the data were also in the U U.S., even though he was located in the Vietnam. Let me make that clear. He was located in Vietnam. He was able to hack into U.S. sites. Then, the, uh, then he'd sell it back to other people in the U.S. who would then use it for tax fraud to, fail, to file fake tax refunds. Which, so, yeah. He was getting away for a number of years. Then he decided, I, somebody said, hey, I could sell you some uh, data, but I have it here in the U.S. So he thought it was a bright idea to fly to the same country he'd been hacking for years. Immediately arrested as soon as he gets off the plane. <laughs> it's not, and it turned out the guy who was trying to sell him the data was actually an undercover Secret Service agent. So, <laughs> so we're all laughing, right? We think it's hilarious. Bad guys, they always screw up. Well, why hacks have their own moments? Uh, this first guy named Wesley Weinberg, um, this was recent actually, Secur he was a security researcher. And there was a bug bounty program Facebook had going, and basically Instagram was part of the scope of the bug, bound pro bug bounty program. He basically founds a flaw, submits it to, to Facebook, right? I was going well. Well, later he writes on his blog how Facebook, you know, don't understand what bug bounty programs are about. They're, you know, harassing him for finding a flaw. And basically, you know, it goes into the scathing review of how Facebook's hostile towards security researchers and uh, their bug bounty program's a sham. Turns out, 
Facebook was on the up and up. Facebook uh, basically agreed to pay him for the bug, even though he wasn't even the first one to find it. Like several people had already submitted the same bug, and it was just it was just a basic Ruby code exploit for an admin control panel. Um, so he finds the exploit, submits it, but then he decides, I'm going to go ahead and use the exploit, hack into the servers, get the API keys for the servers uh, for Amazon S3 keys, and then start going through the S3, the data that's in the S3 buckets, and see what I can find. And then he goes and reports that to Facebook too, which is way out of the scope. You know, they were like, oh yeah, yeah you, the, the keys would be on the server. I mean, that's where they're supposed to go. You already, so he goes way beyond the scope of the uh, exploit. Basically, after that, um, this what happened actually happened was Wes told them like the whole reason he did that was because he didn't think he'd gotten enough money for the exploit. Um, and Facebook at first thought they were fine, and then he starts saying, "Well, that's not enough money," and also I found all this other data. So then Facebook, assuming that he was acting on behalf of his employer then contacts his employer, his employer's like, we don't know why he's doing this, et cetera, et cetera, gets into a whole lot of trouble. So yeah, it's important to stay within scope when you're doing bug bounty programs. Um, finding an exploit and then using it are two different things. Chris Roberts, it's my next story. Um, you pro most of you here have probably heard about this, but if you haven't, he also goes by Side Dragon on Twitter. Twitter. And I'm not, harping too much on Chris Roberts, he's a great guy, he's done a lot of good security research, but even when you're a really smart person, you can do things that are kind of dumb, at least in retrospect. He was flying, um, he'd been doing a lot of research into airline control systems and, and vulnerabilities in airline control systems, and while he was on a flight, he decided to tweet this. Um, if you can't read, it says, find myself on a 737-800, let's see, and he starts listing all of the uh, systems. Let's see if we can start playing with, you know, Ecos messages, pass oxygen on anyone. And, you know, he has a little smiley face, you know, haha, it's a little joke, or whatever. FBI didn't think that was funny. <laughs> um, FBI accused him of hacking into the plane systems, had accused him of, um, hacking to several other plane systems. And all of this was because the FBI was well aware of him because Chris Roberts had told them, had, had approached the FBI in the past about flaws that could be in airline flight control systems and how they could be accessed through the entertainment systems um, that you sit at your seat. So this went all back and forth. Um, later, Chris Roberts said, no, I never actually did that. That was just a joke to make a point. but." Even joking can land you in a lot of trouble. Um, he got into a lot of legal trouble over this. Um, basically, when he got, same, he got off the plane, feds were right there waiting for him and detained him and, and questioned him for hours. Um, yeah, like I said, he maintained the tweet wasn't literal. Basically spent the next year or so in legal trouble and uh, maybe related, maybe not related. His, his company, his security company called Al Al Security was filed for bankruptcy, uh, still active, but it was sold off to another, you know, someone else who's running it now. So, you know, a simple tweak can wreck your life if you're not careful. And then last, um, as far as white hacks go, uh, hack, hackers go, is David Halkowski. He worked for a uh, security research group and uh, a consulting company in Maryland. He was, he was, they were contracted by the University of Maryland to, uh, you know, take a look at their systems. He basically found an exploit and claimed that he found malware already on their system, which was probably all true. He, he basically reported all this and then said that University of Maryland and his lawyer didn't do anything about it, right? So at that point, he's like, he got frustrated. He thought, you know, I have to do something about this. They're not going to do anything. So he hacks into the University of Maryland. He, he did what you would think would be pretty good OPSEC. He used a bunch of VPNs. He downloaded all the personal information for like the UMD security team because he just wanted to make a point. And then he posts it, posts it on Pastebin online to try and see if he can get them to like take it seriously. Well, well, 
he also told all his coworkers what he was doing while he was doing it. And most of them are going to go, wait, that's not right. You shouldn't be doing that. So basically, they were able to easily pin it on him. They knew exactly who put it on the pace pin because he's the same vulnerability. He gets raided by the FBI the next day because his coworkers told the FBI. Like, yeah, this is the guy who did it. He, was, he works with us. Um, he posts on Reddit about it and does an AMA, further admitting guilt. Gets fired, obviously. You know, that, the employer's not going to keep him around for that. And then still maintains he did nothing morally wrong. So I have some other points to make later about this stuff, but the main one here is it's not your job to make a judgment call as to whether or not your employer is doing enough about a security finding. Um, that's their job. It's a business decision. And he doesn't know, he might not have been in the meetings where they're taking it seriously. So if you send a report and you say, hey, I found a serious issue, and they take it, it's not on you what they do after, okay? Just try not to get emotional about it. You, they're probably going to have those meetings behind closed doors, and you're not going to be involved. So, um, someone mentioned OPSEC later on. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about what, what these guys did and what could they have probably done better in the future, like looking at it from hindsight. And if you're wondering what OPSEC is, if you, like, much like the chairman of the board for Stratfor, if you know who that is, it's an intelligence um, group. OPSEC is basically operational security. It's just basic um, things that you need to do, basic practices you have in your daily work routines or methods when you're going, when you're doing anything as far as like, it doesn't even have to, it could be a pen test, it could be, it could be other things that just keep you secure, keep, insulate you, protect you from legal trouble, keep you from going, uh, getting your door kicked down or getting letters from a bunch of lawyers. Basically, the first principle of OXEC is shut the fuck up. So this is not a new concept. It's been around for a while. It's probably the first lesson of OPSEC. So practical applications for shutting the fuck up. <laughs> How about not telling your friends about your illegal activities and then showing them how to do it? If you show them how to do something that's bad, at least don't implicate yourself. In, you're going to automatically implicate yourself, but if you start telling them, you're expecting your friends to go to jail for you. Like, there's not many people, I don't know how good of friends you are, but they're not going to go to jail for you, especially if they have families, they have their own lives to worry about. They're just not. Obviously, maybe not live streaming, think your illegal activities. The internet could help. Maybe not tweeting about your illegal activities. This would help you keep, keep from getting busted. Not, and like I said, I already said, don't trust anyone to risk jail for you. And I mean, this goes as far as just telling stories, right? A lot of us get, especially at these conferences, a lot of us get inebriated and we start telling stories. We want to brag. Everyone wants to tell everyone how, you know, awesome of a hacker, pen tester they are. This can land you in a lot of deep shit. You don't know who's listening, who's reporting. And so, even something you may think is fairly innocent, someone else may not. Right? And even if it does later determined that what you did wasn't so bad, you still just went through a lot of grief because you told the wrong person. The next one is basically compartmentalization. All right? Or as, uh, if you ever listen to rap music, I Got Two Phones. This is a great song. It's basically a rap about OPSEC. So you want... Got, I got two phones. Uh, I, someone help me out here. One for the flow. There you go. <laughs> Keep your various operations compartmentalized. Don't, like, keep, keep everything separate, all right? Because that way you keep the threads leading back to your operations separated. You, you, you keep more dead ends on your trail. All right, first one is compart create cover identities and personas when you operate online, all right? So like you saw earlier with the email addresses people were using, 
If you use identity or persona online, use it for that operation only. And then when you're done with it, get rid of it. Never use it again, all right? Because then if you use it again, you might leave a clue to your identity in one operation, but that's not, a, that's not enough, right, to, get, to come, back to you, come back on you. But you do something else later on that you leave another clue to your identity, you put the two together, and now they know exactly who you are, right? That's also part of contaminating the identities. If you, if you put information about your, uh, that persona, can, you can contaminate that persona by either linking that persona to other personas that you're using or back to your personal identity. That's one that's really, really hard to do. Uh, some of these things are real simple things like posting pictures online under a persona that you've taken that still has the metadata in the tag, like the geolocation data. Um, just talking in a chat room to somebody and mentioning personal details, right, that are actual real details that may seem innocuous by themselves, but if you go back to the chat logs and get enough together, you can assemble enough information to trace back to your real identity. And the biggest one is keep your personal life separate. Don't use the same device, don't use your personal device to do anything. Keep that, that information, because that's gonna incriminate you. You will go back to the uh, guy, Elvis, who was sitting there taking, he had no trade craft whatsoever, like basic things, like don't take pictures of the evidence and leave them on your phone. Like of you with all the stolen cash. Don't buy Rolexes, and $40,000 Rolexes and Porsches, because, especially if your, your, your main persona or identity in real life is a Domino's Pizza employee. That's, that's gonna attract attention by itself, right? So yeah, I guess I was gonna say practical applications for this. Um, I, the last, I've already covered a couple of them, like the, the other guys are using their email addresses. When you get, if you use an email address for something, never use it again, be done with it. If the, uh, the command and control domain, CPYY use, he contaminated that domain when he used an old personal email address. What they should have done is gotten rid of that domain and never used it again for further operations then it could have never been traced back to them. Uh, I had a lot of people I could have put in this talk, and I didn't, and they were just, because they were just obvious things. There was a guy who, uh, he, you've all heard of the fappening, the, the new leak scandals. One of the guys who got busted for it was doing all the, uh, his, he, was, he, got, he broke into half the iCloud accounts from his house, his mom's house, funny enough. And uh, he, <laughs> and, and yeah, he got busted in January, so they got the guy, and he registered the iCloud account that he'd used to uh, fish, you know, this people for their ba for the passwords. He'd registered like a support at iCloud.com or password reset. I can't remember what it was, but he'd registered that account with his personal iPad that he also registered his own iCloud account with. It wasn't hard to find him. So yeah, you don't hack from home. I mean, you got you. Just don't do that stuff. Just don't use the same devices. Even if you're behind VPNs, Tor, whatever, you don't do that stuff. You gotta keep all your things in meat space separate from things in, you know, online. I'm not gonna say cyberspace. <laughs> Except it just did. Uh, so yeah, other OPSEC practices, um, things that could have helped a lot of other people. Make sure you have a plan, right? Know what you're going in for. It's the same thing with a pen test. You know what you're going in for, have a plan for how you're gonna do it. Have clear, definable objectives, okay? If you're thinking about doing something that doesn't help you achieve that objective, like tweet about it, or talk to somebody about it, or take a risk that does not get you towards your objective, don't do it. It's real simple. Um, basically, also, don't keep evidence in your house. <laughs> like, just, don't do that stuff. This is the one, this, like I said, this is one thing Mr. Robot gets wrong. Just yeah, don't hack from your house and don't use devices that you use in your daily activities. Probably get rid of them when you're done with them. Um, be paranoid beforehand instead of paranoid after words, okay? It's better to be paranoid when you're doing something than be paranoid after words when you're wondering if you're gonna get caught because you did something stupid. Also, good OPSEC takes a lot of time it's something you have to build into your routines. It's gonna take you longer 
because of OPSEC, but it also will save you a lot of trouble later on. And the other thing is, of course, stay in scope, okay? Don't, if you're doing a pen test or whatever you're doing, don't go outside of scope. Don't get emotional, okay? Uh, a lot of the guys here got busted, like the guy who hacked the University of Maryland, he got emotional about it, and he went outside of scope. Same thing with the guy who hacked in Instagram, he got emotional about it. Um, you have to think about it objectively, okay? Uh, other resources for OPSEC is the Gruck. Um, I'll fully admit I took a lot of material from this, like lessons from this talk from him, from watching his stocks. Uh, there's a really good one called OPSEC because jail is for uh, WFTPD. And uh, I actually got permission to cite the stuff in this talk, so it's fine. But uh, yeah, this guy's a really good resource. If you haven't watched this stuff already, you should. Even if you're not doing anything illegal, but when you're in the gray, it's good to know these things, especially when you get into like bug disclosure and, and you're disclosing vulnerabilities of people. People will not always be friendly, and it's good to import, it's good to protect yourself. All right. So I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna end this talk with how to do everything wrong. This is the guy who inspired the talk. Um, I know this is not very readable, so I'm just going to explain what's going on here. This is a post to Reddit, legal advice, slash our legal advice. This is a cross post from slash r slash tifu, which means today I fucked up. Uh, basically, the story is this, there was a kid from Belgium. He hacks a Hungarian website for older people. He uses some sort of like PHP shell script to get in. He grabs all their user data. Then he finds out that other people have installed backdoors on the same system, right? So he thinks, oh, well, I'll just let the, ad the people that run this website know what I've did so they can fix it. You know, they won't mind a free pen test. <laughs> and so he, he emails them with his personal email address, <laughs> tells them what's going on. He gets a huge, he gets, of course, a nice nasty ground back saying, You've hacked into our website. We're going to pursue full legal, you know, action against you. And then they also accuse him of basically defacing the website, which he didn't do. But the thing is, if this was, if he, uh, there was other backdoors already on the system, and other people were defacing the website. They, they own right now. The only lead they have is this one guy. So they're going to not just pin the blame for what you did, but everything else he did. So basically now he's asking for legal advice. Okay, now I've emailed them. They know my, my Facebook. They've traced down all my info because I use my personal email. And what should I do? So uh, get a lawyer is the best thing at that point. And then he goes, goes and posts about it on Reddit. So yeah. All right. So anyway, that's the end. This is my actual identity uh, on Twitter. Uh, Digital Shakunin website. Thanks.